Okay, uh, so welcome everybody. <clears throat> Today we have uh, Alessandro Torrielli from uh, University of Surrey, UK. And then just a few words to introduce Alessandro to <coughs> somebody <coughs> in our university who does not know him uh, very well. So he got a PhD in Padua and then uh, he had uh, postdocs in uh, Padua, in Berlin, uh, meet uh, Boston, uh, Utrecht University, University of York, and then he got uh, a permanent position in UK, in University of Surrey, in the south of UK. And he uh, is uh, an excellent teacher and also an expert on integrability, in the application of integrability in uh, ADS uh, CFT. And today uh, he will tell us about uh, lower dimensional ADS-CFT and uh, uh, spin chain integrability. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the very kind invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak at this seminar. I will indeed uh, present, uh, a lit I thought, a little bit of overview of how spin chain integrability as an interplay with uh, lower dimensional ads cft but i'll take the opportunity to just making a little survey of various instances of integrability appearing in ads cft try to give a bit of an overview because there is a very nice picture that is emerging and it seems to be unifying various different empirical observations that were uh, done during these recent years so let me start with just a, a list of uh, uh, reference just for uh, orientation there are some very old now reviews which uh, we wrote in collaboration with others and uh, since I'm, I'm trying to do a bit of an um, of an overview it might be worth uh, mentioning them they contain a lot of the original ideas and how they crystallized uh, and to be used for ads cft um, this is still the traditional ADS-5 uh, CFT-4 correspondence, which I will briefly talk about. Then there is this series of work that I'd like to mention, um, just so that there is a bit of reference of something we've worked in, in our group and with collaborators uh, mostly, um, on lower dimensional ADS-CFT. And there's also some nice reviews if one goes down in dimension, this thesis by Alessandro Sfondrini and Riccardo Corsato. More recently, uh, more people have joined this effort, and I'm very glad that very brilliant young researchers like Chiara, who is in the audience, um, has joined. And we, in fact, had a recent papers, which I will try to describe very briefly again, uh, which has to do with free fermions. Uh, um, still in the spin chain description of uh, ADS-CFT. So a brief outline is indeed, I'll try to make um, a few pillars of what the connection is between integrable string theory and the spin chains and why this formalism comes into the game and is very useful. And I will try to make a little bit of a survey, not with the purpose of being thorough or complete, but just to give an idea of how um, the original concept has evolved uh, as we, the community as a whole, went along exploring different corners and different avenues. And one found incredible similarities so that indeed there must be underneath, and this is what I've always tried to show here, there must be a unique picture that we are only scratching the surface of. Uh, some beautiful algebraic structure, which was sort of seen in different bits, but with um, kind of not yet connected all the dots together to, to see in its whole beauty. Um, of course, there's also crucial differences this, that one encounters going down in dimension, and these differences I will try to highlight, especially this massless integrability. But before that, I'll... I'll one of the most striking um, 
um, universality features of this uh, whole endeavor is this free fermion condition, which with Chiara and collaborators, we really studied in the last paper. And it's remarkably ubiquitous. Everywhere one seems to look in these kind of spin chain realizations of ADS-CFT, one encounters this condition. So there must be something very deep <laughs> uh, somehow in this picture that, that uh, we should grasp. The massless integrability, I will leave towards the end. This was the topic mostly of my last seminar here. So um, I will try to draw some connection, but uh, it will not be the truly main po uh, focus of, of today. So let me start from very far, because I think that there's, there's a, a purpose in trying to recalibrate the, the way we think of string theory from the eyes of integrable systems. This is something that I've learned is quite um, useful. And the standard picture that one has when dealing with string sigma model is uh, what we learn typically in, 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 in productory uh, approaches that the string modes, these oscillation of the string, those are what we should think of as the particles. So string theory, in a sense, is a kind of toy model for quantum field theory. And in fact, we can connect amplitudes, we can study sort of Feynman diagrams in string theory, which are naturally regularized, and they uh, provide for us a tool to study better quantum field theory in this particle type picture, which is um, sort of perturbative. You, you, Indeed, you do perturbation theory in string theory and you have these particle excitations. The picture that instead one should have in mind when dealing with um, the integrable structure is rather the collective excitations of the string, some kind of classical solitons that um, exist because the system is classically integrable. The 2D sigma model is a classically integrable system in one plus one dimension, which are two dimensions of the string wall sheet. And these um, solitons can be exactly quantized thanks to the quantum inverse scattering method. So we have a tool to exactly quantize these excitations and to access the non-perturbative um, sector of the theory. So this is somehow a bit different from the standard approach in, in string theory, and it's very fruitful. In ADS-CFT, there is on top of this another picture which I find um, quite interesting, and it's of course closely related. And it goes a little bit like this. I've tried to reproduce this picture we have again classical strings, which because of cancellation of anomalies and consistencies, we know had to live in some 10 dimensional space. But in ADS-CFT, and for instance, I have in mind um, the first example, ADS-5-CFT4, where there's an ADS-5 background, cross S5 to make the 10 dimension. And there is a field theory in four dimension that is exactly equivalent to it. One has this classical string, which is just a chord that moves in this 10 dimensional space. But in the field theory, there are various fields. And they are located at the holographic point. So it would be uh, the four dimension of the dual field theory. And I've tried to arrange them in such a way that they uh, correspond to some sort of lattice regularization or lattice discretization of this very same contour. In fact, the observable that corresponds to this string that captures the energy of the string is this single trace operator where all these fields that, which are matrices, so they have some uh, indices that are contracted. Alessandro, can I, yes. just, because I see a, a line uh, uh, which is a hiding. Hide, uh, thank you, yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it better? Yes, yes, okay. Excellent, thank you, thank you. Yes, so this, these fields are all organized into this trace. They are all um, matrices. And um, this corresponds to a sort of a quantum state of this otherwise classical string. That is why the picture of spin chain um, comes into play, because this composite operator, which has the trace and therefore is cyclic, one can think of a 
an array of spins on a chain. And here I've tried to put these spins, which are of course generalized spins. They can transform in higher dimensional representations of the symmetry algebra of the theory. It's not just a CU2 spin, a spin up and down, but it could be a variety of polarization. Depending on these fields, they align onto this cyclic chain because of the trace. And that's why the one, one can then simply shortcut the circuit and say that this classical string is quantized onto states of a quantum spin chains and the Hamiltonian that one writes for such a spin chain will give the energy. Uh, the spectrum should be the spectrum of the quantum string theory, uh, the quantization of the classical sigma model. So via the field theory, actually one can uh, simply make a bridge here and think of a quantization of a string. In fact, uh, in this other slide, but it's probably even more visible. So this produces the spectrum of a quantum field theory, which would be the string sigma model via a spin chain. And of course, if I go back to this picture, in the process, I also get for free the spectrum of a four-dimensional quantum field theory, which is also quite uh, non-trivial to do because all these have the same energy. So precisely where integrability enters is at this stage, because as it was realized, uh, most importantly by Minahan and Zarembo, um, the uh, Hamiltonian that corresponds to this spectrum, which for the field theory would be the dilatation operator that one can diagonalize, um, corresponds to the Hamiltonian of an integrable spin chain. For instance, if I arrange my fields to be this particular SU2 sector, the theory, the dual field theory in that special case has six scalars, phi1 to phi6, and I can arrange them in pairwise into complex scalars. And if I focus on two of them, I can organize these states in such a way that I only have Ws and Zs. And then I decide that Z, I call it spin down and W spin up. And there I have my state, one of the particular states of my quantum spin chain. The Hamiltonian at one loop, because of course this there'll be a coupling constant in all this game and I can do the dilatation operator in perturbation theory, which is equivalent to say that I compute my Hamiltonian order by order in, in the coupling constant. At the lowest non-trivial order in the coupling constant, I get the Heisenberg spin chain. So just the XXX isotropic spin chain for this spin up and spin down, which is immediately recognized as integrable. And then a lot, a great part of the work of the community was to construct the higher loops and then to implement the inverse scattering method and to check that integrability was preserved order by order and then one could simply forget about perturbation theory and derive exact results. So it seems that spin chain play a role. And in fact, um, here is where immediately the beta ansatz comes into play, which is one of the favorite, if not the favorite way to diagonalize these spin chains. And it's worth just going very quickly through it because it will bring in the concept of S matrix, which then becomes the most important notion. Um, the way to diagonalize the spin chain is just the beta ansatz from this um, uh, very sort of milestone work. One construct, for instance, the two particle states by declaring that the Zs are a C of, uh, say, spin down, vacuum state, and all the other spins here, V and W, but it could be two Ws actually here. Uh, I've introduced yet other spins, but it could be two copies of Ws with spin up. There are two disturbances in the C of vacua, and I give them some momenta by concocting the, the wave function in this way, e to the i p1 n1 at the location n1, p2 n2, and then there is an exchange with the S matrix factor, which tells me that the two have interchanged. So I have two traveling waves on the chain, and they will exchange the phase factor itself, which is just the S matrix for physical momentum. This particular ansatz for the wave function diagonalizes the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. Um, and then 
this is still on the uh, in the asymptotic region. So, so at the moment, of th uh, I'm imagining that the spin chain is infinitely long for a moment. So I can simply have asymptotic states, spin disturbances that come from minus infinity and go to plus infinity. If I want to remember that the, the spin chain might be finite of length L, meaning L sides, uh, I just do the beta equations, which are encoded in this set of algebraic equations. I just take M of these excitations that here were just two. I put M on the chain. I close the loop. I have L sides, which I haven't drawn and M excitations, which I have indicated with these arrows. And then I imagine that by picking the kth one and running around the loop, I have either a factor e to the i pkl for periodicity or a product with all the other uh, particles which pick up an S matrix. And if I have these M equations, because I can do it for each of the uh, magnons or these excitations, um, on this ferromagnetic spin chain, and ferromagnetic because um, the sign of the coupling constant, so somehow this, these spin chains are ferromagnetic, um, I get this set of M coupled beta equations which quantize the momenta on the chain. I can import at this point, I think this was crucial to, to find out in, in, in those days, uh, because one could immediately then borrow the whole machinery of integrability. Once one realizes how the variables are uh, translated, one can then borrow the entire machinery. And, and there are big equations, um, in fact, for all these models, con um, conjectured and proven in, in various ways um, for all these um, different models. So, so far, I've tried to give a kind of quick snapshot of how integrability comes into play. Now, let me give you another type of survey, which is what are these backgrounds? What are these string theories that are subject to this um, treatment? And this, again, uh, most of the details here will not be entirely or crucially relevant, but I do it because it's good to see them all and to see that in their diversity, they have commonalities. So these papers, especially the one by um, Zarembo uh, and then also by Linus Wolf, they pose themselves the question, what does a string theory need to have? What kind of requisites does it, does it need to have to be integrable and to be a string theory? So they precisely pose the question, um, suppose that I take one of these supergroup Coset. So it became pretty quickly um, evident that one has to start from somewhere. And the, the starting point is that these are all supersymmetric models, super string theories, and one has to construct some um, coset of certain supergroups um, and, and then put a, a theory on top of them, which is this Metsayev Zeitlin action. There's a natural way of writing an action. So that was a sort of starting point. Everyone knew that one should construct these models in this particular way. For integrability, if it was realized by Bena, Polchinski, and Reuben that in order to be able to write a Lux pair for these models, it was sufficient to have a Z4 symmetry in this coset. So the question immediately arises, can we classify all these supergroup cosets with Z4 symmetry in such a way that they are uh, string theories. Uh, them being integrable is guaranteed at this point. This line guarantees integrability, but they might not be string theories. So they might be anomalous. So this paper in particular posed the question, can I take a classification of these theories, impose the, the anomaly um, cancel so that the beta function vanishes, they, of course, did a one-loop analysis, so they conclude that these are only sufficient conditions, but, but then one goes out and checks case by case and verifies whether the beta function is actually zero at all loops. But at least in one, at one loop, can we classify um, all these supergroup cosets such that they are string theories? And the condition becomes very simple. The killing form 
of the super algebra that's behind this coset must vanish. And for least super algebras, there is only certain families for which the killing form is zero, and they are the families of PSUN slash N. These are fermionic generalization of SUN, where you have N bosons and N fermions, same number, so that the killing fo form vanishes. Or you have another class, which is OSP, generalization of the orthosymplectic to 2n plus 2 boson and 2n fermion direction, again. And then you have this exceptionally superalgebra, which is d21 alpha. It became a group theory question. Uh, the classification became purely group theoretical because the beta function has this nice killing form in front. So if you if you kill it, then you kill the entire beta function. So it's just a matter of looking through the literature and seeing what models fall into this class. This will be all integrable, at least sufficient condition for integrability is met, and then one can study them. And it's no surprise that the, 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 print, the, the, the uh, main uh, model is immediately there. This is where Madlacena started from. ADS5 CFT4 is based on this coset. PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4 and modulo the real form, which is 2 comma 2 instead of 4. This is exactly one of these. So it's reassuring to recover the original the starting point. This is a model where there is an ADS5. So the string theory, which lives in 10 dimension, has an ADS, which is 5 dimensional. So the dual field theory will be four dimensional and it is this famous n equal four super young mills in four dimension where all the work has been done all the tools have been sharpened in this model it's very super symmetric it has a great amount of symmetry symmetry 32 and the coset is this one has to use this particular psu family and divide by, by certain bosonic sub I won't go into the detail because these are all the sort of the specifics, uh, sort of a, the, the, the details of the machine. We don't really need to know, but there is a, a detailed list of how all the coupling constants are related and all the rank of the gauge group here uh, maps to the other side. But I've, I've used a smaller font because we don't really need them. This is the five dimensional problem and suffices to say a bit Boldly, as many in the community believe, basically, by now, that the spectral problem has been solved. In fact, Marco can confirm he was part of the effort that finally uh, solved the problem. And now we have tools where, when I say we, they have tools, um, people like Gromov and Volin, they've developed what they call the quantum spectral curve approach, which seems to be an incredibly fast tool to derive all the uh, perturbative results numerically with, with a very efficient algorithm. But also conceptually, uh, it, this is the model we are most comfortable with. We basically seem to understand pretty much all the, there is to say. One can go down and in four dimension one encounters another member of the family. Let's go back and see whether, it, so this is, should be one of these because it's OSP six slash four, yes. So it's n equal two, and it is indeed a zero killing form uh, uh, example. And now the, the theory is on ADS4 cross CP3, and it's dual to n equal six churn Simons in three dimensions. So we've gone down one dimension in duality. Uh, well, the, of course, we have to make up for the 10 dimensions still, but the, the non trivial dynamics, uh, crucial part always happens now in one dimension S. Still zero killing form, a bit less supersymmetry. And um, this is the coset. Again, this was from the point of view of integrability, a bit of a quicker story historically because the spectral problem is almost identical. In fact, it's just one copy. Um, this uh, one discovers that in this kind of spin chain, there is a particular algebra which I'll come to later, which is two copies of a, of a certain reduced algebra. And this was just one copy, but basically it was exactly the same, apart from a, a possible renormalization of the coupling constant. So all the non-triviality of this 
model with respect to the former, at least for what the spin chain is conserved, is that it dresses up the, cu the coupling constant in the, instead of being lambda, it's some function of lambda. Lambda is what this what is called this um, toothed coupling. Uh, in this example, may yes. I ask your question? Yes, yes, of course. This function h of lambda has been uh, found uh, exactly. Or, I remember that Gromov found some checks, some uh, uh, gave some uh, form for this function. Is it uh, known uh, now? The the best paper is the, as to my knowledge is indeed this paper by Gromov et al. Where they have two ways of um, finding an expression for this h of lambda. One is from the quantum spectral curve, uh, but the other is from localization. They seem to be able to use localization in a way which I, at the moment I wouldn't be able to reproduce, but to check that this complicated expression that they conjecture or, or, or derive from the other method is also reproduced by localization. So yes, that, that's absolutely true. They have now an, uh, some proposal, they have some yeah, proposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so what is then more recent work is going down to three dimensions. So three dimension, there is a, another set of model, and here the story becomes a little richer. So ADS3 CFT2 now. So let's start with this particular model. This, here we will have two favorite backgrounds. One is ADS3 cross S3 cross S3 cross S1. We still need to make a 10, but now the ADS is only here. So the dual CFT is one dimension less than three. So that's the CFT2, and it's a very mysterious one. There are a lot of papers speculating. It's not quite well known, uh, despite, uh, on the contrary, the, the previous examples had very well-known dual field theories. This one is rather mysterious. But the string theory is still well defined, and now it comes with this particular member of the family. Two copies, but still the killing form is zero. Uh, less supersymmetry, there's what is called large n equal form com4 supersymmetry, and the coset is this one. Um, the nice uh, point of view of integrability is that although it was known that this CFT2 is quite mysterious and this duality is less under control, the integrability structure um, fills the gap. Uh, without knowing what the CFT2 is, if we can derive a spectrum from the spin chain, then we can simply declare that that is a quantization of these models. And we can perhaps reverse engineer uh, what the CFT2 simply by defining it via the spin chain. That is an approach that is becoming more and more uh, suitable to this kind of, um, of theories that as you go down, they start to become, instead of getting easier, they become more difficult. Um, if it were not because a new um, a sort of novel component in this picture, a new piece of the puzzle appears, which is these massless modes. I haven't said that before, these two examples only involved a spin chains with massive excitations, so gapped spin chains. Uh, in this case, we start finding that there are massless excitations, gapless excitations, which is a novelty. And from the point of view of integrability is um, uh, trickier. In fact, it might come to help because, as uh, I remember, we discussed also with people in, in the audience at the other seminar, there are relations with conformal field theory and massless flows. But so this might actually go in the direction of uh, telling us a bit more what this mystery CFT2 might be. But it's, it's certainly more complicated. All the tools that were developed, in particular, this quantum spectral curve and the full TBA um, is not entirely under control for when massless modes are present. In fact, it's sort of work in progress. So this is one particular example. There is a sister example, which is ADS3 S3 T4 still 10 dimension that you can obtain from the previous one by tuning the parameter alpha to 
either zero or one. Alpha basically controls the ratio of the radii of these two spheres, and you can blow up one or the other. So if you send alpha to zero or to one, you're enhancing one or the other sphere and making it into a large space, which then you can sort of assimilate into a T4. You see here, one sphere has been somehow uh, has vanished and it's been assimilated into a completely flat directions. This this process can be uh, dealt with at the level of the algebra, and there is a what's called inonu Wigner contraction of this algebra to this particular algebra, which is still a member of the family. This is the n equal two member of this family, modulo real form. So. This one is also integrable. This has been studied very extensively. It also has 16 supersymmetry, but this what they call the small n equal 4, 4, which is a sort of infinite dimensional extension of this superalgebra. And this is the coset. And there are even more massless modes because these flat directions, if you have flat directions, sort of intuitive that once one does the semi-classical quantization one will pick up more massless modes so it's even more uh, interesting now to bring the massless modes into the games the dual theory has been studying very much by these authors especially and it's a sort of symmetric or bifold theory uh, cft2 um, which with other approaches can also be tested and one can check whether integrability gives the same type of answer. What we, we did, and I say we because we decided with, with Ben Hoare and um, Antonio Pitelli, my former student, to delve even deeper. We went down to the smallest you can have. The smallest ADS-CFT you can have is this. It's ADS-2, CFT-1. So here, there's still 10 dimension. But ADS, where the real dynamics is, is just two dimensional. So the dual field theory has to be a one dimensional, so only time. It's basically a super conformal quantum mechanics, or it could be a chiral CFT with only a part of the modes. But again, it, it, one message is that this becomes very confusing uh, if you just look at it with the traditional eyes of string theorists and field theory, in fact, it's not even clear what we sh we're supposed to do here, what kind of observable to compute. It's quite complicated to study superconformal quantum mechanics in this setting. But integrability doesn't mind. The, the framework is universal enough that once you specify an algebra, you can just proceed with the machine. You see, there's very little supersymmetry and one has to work a bit uh, harder with representations. In particular, there's an interplay between long and short representations, which is quite peculiar. But we did manage to conjecture a, an S matrix for these magnons that scatter on the line. The, the chain is always the same. The picture is always that of a spin chain. And to carry out some tests of this integrable S matrix to try to reproduce certain beta equations that exist in the literature. The two-dimensional case also comes in two flavors, if you want. There is this one, but there is also, I oh, know, I haven't reported it. There's also ADS2, S2, S2, T4. So that's also uh, just one copy of D21 alpha. Why didn't I report it? I forgot. So there is the, the analogous story where you can promote uh, this to have two spheres with a certain ratio of um, radii. And then you get D21 alpha instead of this PSU1, which is still from the family. At this point, you can't go lower than that, because if you try to go lower, you have the CFT0, and that I don't know what it is. It's just a point. So they seem very diverse. I hope that this quick survey showed how strange these are in space-time in the target space, if you want, as string theories. In fact, it's not quite clear what the string theory would do in this space because it's already two-dimensional, so how it, it would fit. Nevertheless, the spin chain can go through, and modulo differences, of course, because case by case one has to look at the specifics, 
the, the principle seems to be always the same. So behind all these models, there seems to be the same core idea why they're integrable, why they are exactly solvable. So I've tried to give the snapshot here. And the point is that one of the traditional way to solve the spin chain, as we have seen in that quick picture of the SU2, is to fix a vacuum, to fix a sea of spin, say all down, and have excitations that um, perturb this vacuum. And in this case, this will leave some residual algebra, because if you have a big um, supersymmetry algebra, but then you fix certain states, you then want the excitation to transform on a smaller, on the little group, if you wish, if you wish of, the, of those supersymmetry generators, which leave the vacuum invariant. And this characterizes the symmetry of the magnons. The magnons transform under the little group, and the little group are listed here. These are much smaller superalgebras. In particular, these are finite dimensional. They represent, they admit unitary finite dimensional representations. And these tend to be much more similar to one another. In particular, they, they're always from this family PSU2. So the actual excitations, the magnons, transform as irreducible representations of these respectively PSU2 slash 2 squared or PSU2 slash 2 in four dimension. If you go down, you get these PSU1 slash 1 left and right because you have a CFT2 now, so you have left and right move, movers or squared in case you go into D4. And then you have this uh, PSU1 slash 1 square for the two dimensions. And these are all classical in the sense that once you look at the algebra, you fix the vacuum, but classical in the sense that um, they're just kinematic. So you fix the vacuum and you just look at the algebra which preserves the excitations. Quantum mechanically, they're all centrally extended. This is very familiar in supersymmetry. The moment you, you introduce the, the quantum corrections, the anti-commutator of the supercharges starts to develop some central charge. And typically the central charges take care of the momentum of the energy momentum of these magnons. So the way one can give these, these momenta, which I was talking about, whereby the, the waves on the spin chain have some momentum is thanks to these central extensions, which gives them some energy momentum tensor on the right hand side of anti-commutator of supersymmetry. And this was the big idea of Niklas Beiser to introduce these central extensions in the first place here. And they carry over all these algebras, admit a central extension. In fact, the triple central extensions, which ultimately is related to the energy momentum of these magnon. And from here, one can proceed with the inverse scattering method. The uh, other similarities and differences are somehow condensed in, in this slide, which sort of ends, I believe, yes, it does. And the, the survey of string theory is amenable to integrability. So the massless magnons are only if you're in dimension lower than three, so three and two. That seems to be a feature there, and they have to be dealt separately. So that the massless integrability and the massless flows or conformal TBA, that is a story that has to go only for this particular uh, ADS3 and ADS2. But apart from this, in general, uh, there's a list of uh, remarkable similarities, which we are still quite far from understanding why that actually is. Because as you've seen, the theories are, they look very different and the dimensionality is very different. But it seems to be First of all, that there's a choice of variables to describe the scattering theory, which is this Zhukovsky variables, which is very useful. And apart from the massless sector, where we have found that there are uh, different variables which are actually more suitable, it seems to be universal. So the, why the string theory likes to use this particular Zhukovsky parametrization, when I say like is things become very natural, in particular, they rationalize on these variables. So that's a mystery. All these are centrally extended and all have vanishing killing forms. So another striking thing is that 
even the little groups are from the family with vanishing killing form. That was also a surprise. And we have some ideas why that might be related to quantum groups. But again, this doesn't have to be because these are just the, this is just the symmetry of the magnum. It doesn't control the beta function or, or, or anything. But still, it's still from the same family PSUN slash N. So that's quite strange. They all have a, a particularly braided coproduct, which perhaps I might be able to get to. That's also a very interesting story. They all seem to have a Jungian type symmetry. That's another thing. These spin chains seem all to be rational for, for one reason or another, starting from the XXX. They just seem to have a Jungian, and, and there was a lot of work in extracting exactly how the Jungian looks for all these different models, but it seems to reproduce. So perhaps one of the hint at this universality is that there is just a Jungian, a gigantic Jungian, which is taken in different representations and different representations are different string theories. Maybe that's the way to think about it. The, the thing that I might say a few words about is this free fermion condition. All these spin chains seem in one way or another to produce this fact that they either satisfy the free fermion condition or they have it embedded in some layer structure. And this is something that with Chiara and collaborators we have worked recently on. And they also have another thing which we have kind of discovered in the past, this bonus symmetry, which is a particular enhancement of this Jungian, which was also, again, quite bizarre, but it seems to be everywhere here. Every version of this model has their own secret or bonus symmetry. So there must be some very strong quantum group reason for all these things. And we just see various corners, but in the center, the, there must be some gigantic quantum group that controls all this. So since I am getting, so 47, how much time do you think I still have? Uh, still 20 minutes. 20, okay. Then I can say a few words about this free fermion condition and maybe I'll jump ahead just to say, yeah, maybe I can go through this story. Um, okay, so this is something we've recently um, noticed is that all these, so once we try to solve the spin chain with the inverse scattering method, we conjecture an nest matrix for the scattering of these particles. Now it's not just a simple phase factor as in the XXX case, it has, depending on the, on the symmetry of the magnon, it has a truly matrix structure. For this particular case, the three-dimensional, which we focused on in the paper, uh, well, in fact, also others, uh, ADS2 as well, the type of representations for the magnons that one can reduce the problem to are simply one boson and one fermion. So the one can strip off all the complication and simply say, I, at the end of the day, I have a spin chain with one boson and one fermion in variety of flavors, but I can reduce to the core. And this one boson and one fermion uh, allows me to write my four by four S matrix. This is a scattering of two of these particles, which could be either boson or fermion, into each other. And there is four by four combinations that I can have. Boson, boson into boson, 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 boson into fermion, fermion. I have to preserve fermion number. So that's why these zeros here. But the type of R matrix, R or S, depending on, on, on who's on the literature, mathematical literature tends to call R matrix, but we see it arise it from the model as, a, um, as an S matrix. Um, it's either of eight vertex type, meaning full, all the entries that could be non-zero, uh, preserving fermionian symmetry are indeed non-zero, or six vertex type when you kill the R8 and R7. So in the end, we can reduce uh, all our complicated inverse scattering model down to either six vertex or eight vertex type. And then we check the entries, which we know for each uh, and every one of these models, and they all satisfy this, which is recognized as what they call the free fermion condition. 
which comes from far away literature. There's a there's a very uh, there's a wonderful literature on, on free fermion conditions and um, how they were used then to diagonalize very important models. Um, but we just um, see it emerging just by staring at the particular model. This, this, this was, again, another realization. It seems to happen everywhere. In ADS5 and ADS4, these S matrices are more complicated. They're 16 by 16, but they can also be layered a bit into sub parts, which uh, much like the Hubbard model, um, which can be sort of uh, decomposed into two XX chains, uh, they also satisfy this layer structure and uh, they also admit this free fermion description, which was contained in this paper. So what we decided to do with Chiara and our collaborators was much inspired by this whole literature, in particular these uh, early papers where they use heavily uh, particular transformations on the states of the spin chain to diagonalize the Hamiltonian explicitly, to put it in free fermion form. So we could just uh, borrow the, the very same procedure. And these bosons that we have coming from the string theory and the fermion, we just use these free fermion operators to generate them. And we have our nice free fermion algebra of anti-commutators. So what I've decided to encapsulate here is just a translation between the formalism, which is most familiar from the string theory and then the sort of integrable spin chain, which we tended to use uh, uh, previously, which is just these unit matrices that create a, a boson out of a fermion or vice versa, and simply translate these generators. Uh, this is how they act. So one is a boson and two is a fermion and E just changes B into an A. Alessandro, may I ask yes. you, yes, just yes. to fix uh, ideas, maybe it's too simple, my question, but could, could, could one uh, think that phi is uh, some spin-up state and psi is spin, spin-down state, just to make a comparison with spin chain? Or is it too simple, this picture? It, it, it would up to the signs. So in a sense, there is a way to um, introduce simply the, the, the spin, uh, spin up and spin down. Uh, there are, however, crucial signs, for instance, here. Uh, th this state then has to be fermion in order to respect the signs of the original SU1 slash 1. So in a sense, it would be an SU1 slash 1 rather than SU2. Okay, yes, okay. But, but the formalism can actually go quite the same. And in fact, if, if memory serves me right, these papers do deal with SU2 spin chains in free fermion formalism. They can sort of arrange the states in such a way that they can still use fermions, although they have spin, they have Pauli matrices. There's a sort of yes. transformation. For instance, for the XX chain, you can diagonalize by using fermions. Yes, 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 yes. So in our case, these are truly fermions to begin with. So the site is a fermion. It would be more akin to an upward model where you have the electron, wow. in a sense. Okay, thank you. So this formalism then becomes very useful. And in, well, in the following, let me simply, well, let me skip this. This is just to give an example of, from this particular family. Maybe I'll, I shall focus on this one. In this, I've basically re-summarized what this particular example was and the two possibilities of ADS3, S3, S3, S1, and T4. And here I have spelled out a bit more specifically what the masses are. When I was saying that you have massless modes is because some of the masses of these magnons that travel along the chain happen to have zero mass now. Other excitations have mass one, or one minus alpha, alpha, but when alpha goes to one, you just get the one and the zero, and you get these massless modes. But each of them transform under the PSC one slash one squared, or SC one slash one squared. So this is really, I've decided to spell out entirely the Lie super algebra with all the supersymmetry, 
and the central extension. One can see the central extension. And you see, here is the representation. The supersymmetry act on this boson and fermion and transform into one another with some parameters that depend on the momentum. So one can have a completely explicit matrix description of this representation. And the central charges act in a way that they give the energy of the magnon. Incidentally, the dispersion relation of these magnons is incredibly similar or basically identical to Ising model in magnetic field, where this one should be replaced by the difference between the magnetic field and the critical value. So it goes to zero for critical uh, chain. And this is exactly the type of uh, dispersion relation that one finds in Ising. So it's, it's quite remarkable, again, that this spin chain nature emerges uh, from the string theory, which is quite uh, interesting. And here is the story I was uh, mentioning about the co-product, but I don't think, let me skip that, because um, somehow this representation has an additional complication, which by now we know how to deal with. Uh, it's dynamical, meaning when the supersymmetry act, it also changes the length of the spin chain. It reduces the number of vacuum sites by one, or it adds one. But that is not a big concern. In fact, dynamical spin chains can be dealt with very easily with the language of OPF algebras. So all I wanted to do here is to show that all it does, all this extra uh, creating and annihilating sites, vacuum sites, it just gives a little non-locality to the co-product on the S matrix. So there's a simple derivation whereby one can um, show that this, it's basically changing the way the supersymmetry or the central extension acts on two particle state because it, it acquires a non-locality in the co-product, something we did many years ago. But let me conclude with um, this free fermion realization. So here is an example of the specific matrix realization in full detail and the S matrix or R matrix in a particular sector, but it, it suffices for our purposes. There is an explicit matrix construction, and this is the input of the inverse scattering method. One has to construct the transfer matrix, take traces, and uh, derive the infinitely many conserved charges, or construct the monodromy matrix, take the B operator, and act in the fashion of the algebraic petty ansatz to generate the state from the pseudo vacuum. So once one has this, one can go through the algebraic petty ansatz, and we had done it earlier, but then we discovered, and sorry, this, yeah, we discovered that if we uh, parameterize the R matrix in a specific way um, and use this free fermion realization, uh, realization of the of the matrix. So you see these matrices now, this can be written simply in terms of this EIJ, which we had, these jumping back and forth, these ones. These can be easily realized by these matrices. So it's just a matter of translating wherever there is this one, one puts either a C or a C dagger and simplifies everything. And one finds expressions for the transfer matrix, for instance, on two sides, which looks like this. So there is site one and site two. This is a transfer matrix on a two side spin chain, but just to begin with. And what one notices in the spirit of those Lieb, Schulz, and Mattis papers is that but simply by performing a Bogoliup of transformation with a particular angle, which is related to this theta. These thetas are the inhomogeneity of the spin chain because in order to do the algebraic petty answers, we need to keep the chain inhomogeneous. So each side has a little inhomogeneity, but that, that can be dealt with. If we use this transformation, we can recast the transfer matrix in this very, very simple form. Apart from a global factor in front, it's just one minus twice the new number operator. Never mind this, this have been a bit uh, hyperbolic. Ah, yeah, I wanted to write this in this fashion. So you can show, since these are fermions, now this is the number operator of a fermion. So it's either a zero or a one. 
it's, it squares to itself, n squared is n. So you can write this 1 minus 2n as e to the i pi n, because if you expand in Taylor, you get exactly the same because the series truncates. So this is even more complicated than it looks because it's simply, apart from this number, which one has to carry around, it's, it's just a global phase factor. Uh, it's just minus to the n, where n is this new number operator. So in going from here, in fact, in going from here with this R matrix into this, I think was the biggest realization of my summer last week. It was a shock last year because um, to, to, to realize that the transfer matrix is just minus one to the n, where n is the new fermionic number, was completely unexpected. And then we had this other realization that it's the same for the R matrix. It's not only surprisingly, and I still don't quite understand how it could be, but it, it does happen. The very same R matrix also has the same form. So it's also the same, and it, it's minus one to the N. And it all, once we realized, it, then we, we went and checked that all the properties of the R matrix and the transfer matrix, which we knew existed, uh, all have a translation in free fermion language. For, for instance, the supersymmetry, which is this, analog for the supersymmetric generator, this, this would be for the central charge, can be easily written in free fermion form. And if you make this Bogolyubov of transformation, these supersymmetries just become some of these new generators, these ones, eta2 and eta1. They just become eta2 and eta2 dagger. So the fact that they commute with the transfer matrix becomes obvious because the transfer matrix does not depend on them. It's simply minus one to the n1, it only depends on the type one new generator and not on the type two. So this is to say that many, in fact, all of the properties which we had somehow empirically observed, including this very nice relation, which we had found in completely different way years ago, have a very simple explanation once we realize that uh, we can recast everything in free fermion form. The rest, of course, um, this is only on two sides, and this is only the R matrix. But in the rest of the paper, we have a long list of facts and, and also attempts uh, to extend this. It's a sort of similar story goes on also in ADS2 um, and in ADS5. Chiara will be able to say more, perhaps, if there's questions, because she really um, broke down the structure of the ADS5. Uh, part remarkably and trying to find where the free fermion condition sits in there. But there is a host of properties that can be easily reinterpreted now. And it it sort of gives a new perspective and it might really be the missing piece that the, the universality that one was observing in all those cases might well be that it's because there is this free fermion chain behind uh, somehow controlling this structure. So let me skip, I will send the slides. So if, if I hope there will be a lot of um, things that you can look, I'll send everything. Uh, I don't have time to cover, but I just want to finish with this, that a lot of this work uh, and also work that we're trying to push forward also in the context of the TBA, um, might now have a nice reinterpretation in these free fermions. And it's, it's quite exciting to think about all the previous problems that seemed settled now in, in, in this new language. Um, yeah, thank you. you know, I, I hope so. Okay, uh, thank you very much for this nice talk. And uh, thank you. And uh, if there are many, some questions, please. So.
So are, are there any, any questions? Uh, I have one, a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, um, okay, uh, the first one is uh, connected to the first part, no? When you talk about uh, ADS 2 CFT1 correspondence, uh, uh, you say that uh, this one dimensional model is only in a sense, it's still mysterious and it's, uh, it has only time. So is it like a spin chain or something completely wrong? It, it could be. The, I think there has been various conjectures and uh, I think the problem in defining this model is that um, it's the, the conformality. So this is supposed to be a super, super conformal system. So there is a, a super conformal algebra and the spectrum should be controlled by a particular combination of the generators. There is all papers by, I think, Fubini, Furlan, that mm -hmm. outline what the right Hamiltonian should be taken from the super conformal group. And uh, if one makes the sort of the wrong choice, there is some of the generate, the more, the most ge natural generators would be unbounded below. So in order to construct the right Hamiltonian, one has to take a particular combination. And I think this makes it already a bit more difficult to find a, a simply, a simple statistical model that might simulate this, at least to my knowledge. So I haven't delved too much into that literature, but I think it, it seems to be more complicated. The one one instance in which these problems seem to also be very, uh, very much studied is in another type of holography. If I remember correctly, ADS2 cross S2 has something to do with the near horizon uh, um, region of a Reisner Nordstrom black hole. And there was the old idea that one might encapsulate the degrees of freedom of the black hole in this holographic picture via a super conformal quantum mechanics. All papers by Gibbons, and also Jakiv, I guess, Strominger also worked on this. So again, it, uh, it reappears in the literature in, in terms of trying to um, capture this holographic information, um, but it, I've never seen an entire, a, a very sort of diagonalization in the, in the traditional sense. Um, and even the spin chain that we find actually is quite horrible to diagonalize because it's full of longer representations. Even the Magnon ceases to be a short representation apart from the massless mode. So as long as there is a non-zero mass, the representation is long and the tensor product uh, becomes much more difficult to deal with. Uh, there's more parameters. So um, in fact, the, the whole structure becomes, funny enough, more complicated rather than simpler. Um, so this, yeah, I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, the other question is only a curiosity about uh, uh, this free fermion condition because uh, usually uh, all this stuff like uh, Bogolubov rotation and free fermion condition appear in a study of, uh, for instance, XY spin chain. So is it possible to do a, some sort of a <clears throat> relation between uh, this XY spin chain and, uh, and um, the model you are obtaining in the SCFT? Yes. So in a sense here, we suffer because fr from the following shortcoming. The, the R matrix that we deal with is indeed of um, this, say, six vertex type for ADS3. And one could find the Hamiltonian, which is very similar to this type of model, XY, for instance. The problem is that Hamiltonian, uh, you would have to take the homogeneous spin chain, derive the Hamiltonian, treat this 
as an R matrix and then finding the spectrum. The problem is that this R matrix here comes at one nested level up. So in a sense, this is the scattering matrix of two magnons over the C of Z. Imagine that the real representation is Z fermion boson. So fixing the Z, you're left with a magnon which is two dimensional. So the only way to for this to uh, relate to a spin chain is by taking the inhomogeneous transfer matrix and then deriving the eigenvalue and plugging that into the rest of the nested beta ansatz, which is the momentum carrying equation. So in a sense, the, the bottom line is that we can never make contact with this because we all, always need to consider the inhomogeneous transfer matrix because these inhomogeneities are the momenta of the level zero magnon after the nesting. We're already one level up. And that's why we cannot simply say that our chain is XX, say, because it would be an inhomogeneous XX with an extra momentum carrying equation. Uh, but if we forget that, it seems to be still working remarkably well. The free fermion still diagonalizes, at least to the extent where we have uh, reached and then also we have various conjectures for the full diagonalization of the inhomogeneous transfer matrix. It seems again to give the same type of structure but with all the inhomogeneities and if you set the inhomogeneities to zero it doesn't have any physical respondents in ADS because that would be uh, basically just zero momentum states. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, are there uh, any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, we can stop the recording. Thank again the speaker. Thank you. And, uh,